Good morning. My name is Taylor Sutton. I'm one of the pastors here at Zionsville Fellowship, and I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 17 this morning. We'll be looking at the book of Acts in the 17th chapter, and we'll start in verse 16. Acts 17, verse 16. All right, listen to God's word. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know therefore what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him. Yet He is actually not far from each one of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed His offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent, because He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we receive this from you as your holy word, and we ask that you would open it now to our minds and our hearts. Would you help me to explain it and proclaim it faithfully? Be with us now for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. In the uh, 1980s film, Back to the Future, the uh, protagonist, Marty McFly, goes back in time 30 years to the year 1955. And he finds himself in Hill Valley 
his hometown, uh, interacting with, among other people, his own parents as they were at his age. And throughout the film, uh, Marty has a huge disconnect between his understanding of the world and the understanding of everyone around him. At some points, this is just humorous, like when he goes into a diner and he tries to order a soda and he keeps asking for these drinks uh, that didn't exist yet in 1955 and the, the man behind the counter totally misunderstands what he's even talking about. In some ways, it's more serious for Marty because the, the plot that unfolds is if he cannot get his teenage dad to ask his teenage mom out to this dance, they'll never get married, and Marty and his siblings will cease to exist. But the disconnect, of course, is that his dad, his 1955 dad, has no awareness of this existential crisis and is not interested in going to the dance at all. And so throughout the movie, Marty finds himself a stranger in his own hometown. He's a foreigner even to his own family. And under those conditions, basic communication can be difficult. And I think that captures something of what it's like to be a Christian in a secular world. We can often feel like strangers in our own hometowns. We can feel like foreigners to the very people that we love. And that presents some profound challenges for evangelism, being a people for the world. Uh, maybe you've noticed there's been a number of headlines recently about how many people have left churches in America just over the past few years. That is one measure of secularization, uh, decreased religious practice. But there's another measure of what it means to be secular that is a lot more subtle than that. But it's also a lot more pervasive. Uh, philosopher Charles Taylor referred to this other measure of secularization as the conditions of belief. And what he meant by that was this, that a society becomes secular when belief in God changes from being assumed to being one option among many and a problematic option at that. So a society becomes secular when belief in God goes from being assumed, a given, to being one option among many and a problematic option at that. And so under these conditions, some of the bedrock assumptions from which the good news starts become contested and debated. And so it's not hard to consider what that means for our attempts to bring the gospel to the world around us. We have a message about a Savior that we want to tell to people who don't think they need saving. We have answers to problems that they don't think are real. We have good news, the very concepts of which are incomprehensible to the people around us. So the question I want to consider with you this morning is, how do we bring the gospel to a secular world? And I, I think Acts 17 can help us with this question. Because the Athens that Paul encountered in the first century is surprisingly not unlike the secular post-Christian West today. In Athens, as Paul found it, rampant idol worship existed right alongside sophisticated intellectual pursuits. In the Athens of Paul's day, there were many different ways of believing in the deities. Some thought that the deities were real but far off. 
Some, no doubt, continued to worship the traditional Greek gods in the traditional ways, while others posited that God was actually an abstract force that ran through everything. So there was a diversity of views on God, but what was noticeably absent was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so in relating to us Paul's speech in Athens, I think one of Luke's main aims is to show us what happens when the gospel encounters sophisticated paganism. What happens when the good news of the risen Christ comes into the intellectual capital of the Greek-speaking world? And I think what Luke aims to show us is that because the gospel is for everyone, the gospel can be explained to anyone. Because the gospel is a message for everyone, it can be explained to anyone, even people who have no interest in hearing it and who are not prepared to understand it. So to to show you that, And to equip and encourage us all, I want to persuade you that it's true that because the gospel is for everyone, it can be explained to anyone. I want to persuade you that that's true by showing you four simple principles from Paul's speech that I believe apply to our attempts to be a people for the world in a secular world. Four principles for bringing the gospel to a secular world. Number one, how do you bring the gospel to a secular world or to people who inhabit a secular world? Identify the ways they are grasping for transcendence. Identify the ways that people are grasping for transcendence. We see this in verses 22 and 23. Look at the text with me. So here's Paul asked to make an official explanation of this message before uh, probably a, a kind of city council in Athens. And look how he begins. Verse 22, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Now that word religious uh, is open to some interpretation. It's a little bit ambiguous, but it, it seems likely in this context that it, it simply means having a concern for one's relationship with the transcendent realm. To have a concern about one's relationship with the transcendent realm. And so Paul looks at Athens full of idols, full of worship, and says, I see that you care about your relationship with the gods, with the realm above and beyond the merely human. He goes on to explain in verse 23, For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. So Paul found an inscription on an altar dedicated to some God that the Athenians weren't aware of. Now, no doubt they conceived of this altar to an unknown God within the framework of a polytheistic view of the world. They weren't assuming that the unknown God might be the only God there is, but what Paul does is he says that openness to some God that you have somehow missed, I want to talk about that. I want to, I want to tell you more about the God that you are trying to know in ignorance. What therefore you worship as unknown, the end of verse 23 says, this I proclaim to you. So I don't think Paul is just flattering them, just sort of buttering them up to get them on his side before he makes his appeal. Uh, This really, the end of verse 23, that is the framework for his whole address. I am going to proclaim to you the God whom you worship as unknown. You are reaching for something. You're missing it, but you're, you're reaching. You're reaching for something that I can explain. 
The way he puts it a little bit later in verse 27 is that God wants people to feel their way toward him and find him. So he sees them doing that and says, I want to, I want to tell you more. And today, even the most irreligious, secular person that you know is grasping for transcendence. We all desire to, to anchor our sense of identity, our sense of purpose, security, significance. We, we long to anchor that in something bigger than just right now, something beyond just ourselves. So some pursue significance through successful careers. Others grasp for belonging through meaningful relationships. Some people are chasing justice through political ideologies. Even in the endless consumption of entertainment, people are looking for rest. They're looking for beauty and pleasure. And even in those who say there is no meaning, there is no meaning to be found, even in that declaration, what often happens is that declaration becomes a kind of heroic narrative in which the person who's willing to say that is one of the brave few who can face the pointless absurdity of existence. So all of us, everyone you know, is in one way or another grasping, reaching, looking for transcendence. And what you and I can do is to explore with them what that is. And I think this is really helpful because what often happens, or at least this happens to me, is we get stuck in superficial conversations with non-Christians. And we think, I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about the cross and justification and the hope of heaven. How do I get from fantasy football to Christ crucified? It's not easy. I think that what Paul does here is instructive and helpful in one regard, which is this. One way that we get from the superficialities of life to the gospel is we get people talking about what they're really living for. What are they most excited about? What gets them up in the morning? Why do they do the things that they do? I remember one time I had a coworker who uh, we talked a lot during work and we just we were not getting past the superficial and we ha didn't have much in common in the superficial realm. So even that was kind of hard. And one day I just asked him, what do you think the purpose of life is? And that wasn't that successful either. But the point is... <laughs> The point is we all need pathways to break through the superficial, to get off the track of just talking about small talk and helping people see the ways in which they are grasping for transcendence is one way to do that. So this doesn't have to be uh, pompous, telling people, you know, what's the, the secrets of their heart. It could be genuine, curious questions. Why do you do what you do? What's most important to you? What would you most fear losing? So that's the first principle that we see from Paul's address. We can identify the ways that people are grasping for transcendence. Second, show them how the God of the Bible is who they are really reaching for. Identify how people are grasping for transcendence and then show them how the God of the Bible is the one for whom they are really reaching. Paul does this in a number of ways from verse 24 all the way to verse 29. So let's look through a few of the things that he says. So this is Paul. Remember what verse 23 said. He's declaring to the Athenians the God that they are trying to worship without knowing it. Here, here he is, verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. 
And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place for this purpose, verse 27, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. So let's stop there. So Paul, in very quick succession, declares that God is the creator of everything and everyone. He declares that God is Lord. He's the king. He's the master. He is the one who needs nothing from anyone else. In fact, so far is he from needing anything that he is the source of everything. He gives to all life and breath and everything. But despite that lofty reality, Paul goes on to emphasize that God is not only the creator of everything and everyone, not only the Lord of everything and everyone, but that he has made himself knowable, personally, relationally knowable to his human creatures. That's why he made us, verse 27 says, that we might perhaps feel our way toward him and find him. So what Paul is doing here, among other things, is he is explaining to them why it is that they had that sneaking suspicion that their pantheon of gods was missing something. Why did they feel that way? Why was it that all the existing altars to the known gods were not enough? And I think the implication of what Paul's saying is the reason you felt like you were missing something is because you were missing everything. The God who made everything is the God who's unknown to you. So the, the deity that you left out is not an obscure uh, regional God. It's the living God who made you and everything and needs nothing from you. And in all of this, there's a subtle critique of their idolatry. Because what he's showing throughout these verses and what becomes explicitly clear in verse 29 is that the reality of who God is exposes the absurdity, the wrong-headedness of how they are trying to find God. Look at verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art of and imagination of man. This is a beautiful, concise critique of all idolatry. Because all idolatry takes something beneath us and tries to elevate it to something above us. And Paul is saying that doesn't make sense and that will never work. If we are the offspring, if we are in some sense from God, and that's reflected in our personhood, then why would we associate the divine nature with something that is beneath us? But that's what all idolatry does. It reaches down to things that we can manufacture and control and manage and says to it, be my God, be my source of meaning and significance and security, be my portal to transcendence. So what, what Paul is doing in verses 24 through 29 is he's showing them only the living God can satisfy your search for transcendence. Only he can. He's the one you've been looking for. And not only that, but the, the ways that you've been trying to take hold of significance, of, of transcendence, they are doomed to fail. They are internally contradictory. It doesn't work. So think, think about the people in your life and how they are grasping for transcendence. To that person who is seeking significance through uh, success in a career, does that ever work? Is a career ever big enough to hold up a person's significance? It, it's not. Only God can provide real, lasting unshakable significance. To the person chasing after a sense of belonging in meaningful relationships, is that quest ever done? Do you ever feel secure enough 
in your relationships to know that nothing can shake your belonging. No. Only the God who made you can provide ultimate belonging. And the same could be said for justice and for rest and for pleasure and for beauty. God is the source of all these things. And so anyone's attempt to to take hold of them apart from God is just as doomed to fail as trying to take a golden idol that's beneath you and elevate it to be above you. So how do we talk about this with people? Again, one simple way is to just ask genuine, respectful questions. How is that going for you? How's that working? Or how about this? Does that source of meaning in your life, can it survive death? What if that thing you value was taken away? What would that mean for you? So we can help people see the futility, the inadequacy of the ways that they are trying to grasp for transcendence. And we can also show how God alone satisfies those longings. Here's a hypothetical question that you could ask the most ardent atheist. If the God of the Bible was real, would it be possible to have a meaningful life without him? If he was real, would that even be possible? Or you could just tell your story, like we've heard in different ways throughout this series. Explain to your friend or family member or coworker or neighbor how you discovered the futility of other sources of transcendence and found God and God alone to be the only one who satisfies. We want to help people see that in their frantic search for transcendence, the God of the Bible, the living God, the creator of heaven and earth is who they're really reaching for. And nothing less will satisfy. So that's the second principle from verses 24 through 29. Third is this. Warn people that God will hold all of us accountable. Warn people that God will hold all of us accountable. Look at verse 30. Verse 30, Paul turns a, a corner. He's, he's gave his main declaration of who God is. He's, he's done the work uh, that verse 23 promised to proclaim to you what you worship in ignorance. Now in verse 30, he's going to call them to something. Look at verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. So God is commanding everyone, Paul says, to repent. That just means to turn, to turn away from false gods and turn towards the true God. These sophisticated pagan Athenians have a responsibility, a God-ordained responsibility to repent, to stop worshiping fake gods and give their worship and trust and loyalty to the true God. And Paul gives a reason in verse 31. There's a reason that they must do that. There's a reason that God has commanded that. And the reason is he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. So a day of reckoning has been appointed. It's been set. It is coming. A day when every single human being will have to answer for the things that we have done. And Paul says, in light of that, you need to repent. You need to turn to this living, true God who made you. 
Now, in Paul's address here, what really gets the Athenians offended is the talk of resurrection, which is in the very next phrase. I think in our day, it's probably judgment. It's not just offensive to people, it's kind of ridiculous. It sounds like an artifact of a primitive uh, bygone era when people believed in silly things like judgment day. So let's be honest. This is hard for us to talk about with people who we know think it's ridiculous. This is not popular. This is not comfortable. And yet it is absolutely essential for secular people, just like all other people, to know. Because first of all, the gospel doesn't make sense without a holy God who punishes sin. It just does not even achieve basic coherence. But think about it. Like, if the gospel is just, God wants you to be happy and have a full and meaningful life, therefore Jesus died on the cross. That doesn't make sense. Like, it doesn't add up. The gospel assumes the unavoidable reality that the holy, sinless creator of everyone has a right and indeed a commitment to deal with human wickedness. So the gospel won't make sense without it. But, but secondly, if this is true, then this is a part of all of our future. So if we're going to talk to people about ultimate reality, we ought to tell them about what's coming, even if they don't believe it. So we want to warn people that God will hold all of us accountable. So how do we do this? How do we actually talk about this? Um, there are a number of ways. Let me just give you an idea. Uh, people have, I think everyone has, a built-in justice meter. They're calibrated differently. They, they fire off on different things. But we all have this deeply ingrained sense that it is wrong and disturbingly wrong for someone to commit evil and then get away with it. For someone to do wrong in some way and then avoid the consequences. There are few things in life that stir up as much anger as that. Now, some would say, well, that's just the result of evolutionary biology. We're a social species, and so it has served our species to have this sort of sense of, of fairness that helps us, you know, not devour each other. But what if that sense of justice is instead a reflection of the person who made us? What if, again, there actually is a personal creator that underneath all of the impersonal matter and energy and time is a person. If there is such a person, does he not have the right to hold his creatures accountable? He does. Another way that we can talk about this is to, is to help people see that this is God announcing judgment. It's not us. Part of the problem I think that people have with a belief in divine judgment is that it, it sounds self-righteous, vindictive, like believing this makes you a vindictive, barbaric person. And so part of what we want to show people is that we did not make this up to soothe ourselves. This is in the Bible. Like God has said this. And even if someone doesn't believe that the Bible is God's word, you can at least show them that it's in the Bible and ask them to interact with that. Why would the Bible say that? What, what do you think it would mean if this was not true? So we can, we can help people see that this is not just our wishful thinking, that we just really want the, those bad people to get it, but that we have a word from God that announces that judgment is coming, and it applies to all of us. So, what have we seen so far? We want to identify the ways that people grasp for transcendence. We want to try to show them how God is the one they're really reaching for. And then third, we want to warn them 
that God will hold all people accountable. And now, fourth, ask them to consider the resurrection of Jesus. Look at how Paul ends this address. So he's talking about judgment in verse 31. God will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Can we just, can we just be honest and say that's probably not how you and I would have like drawn up the conclusion to this speech? Like, where's the cross? Where's the atonement? Where's the offer of forgiveness? What is Paul doing here? All he says about Jesus is he's the one through whom God's going to judge the world, and God has given us assurance of this through the resurrection. So what, like, what is going on here? Well, it's possible that Paul was interrupted. Some people think that verse 32 indicates as much, that when they heard resurrection, they just couldn't listen any longer. So that's possible. It's also possible that Luke has abbreviated the address and that he's omitted other things that Paul said to emphasize particular themes here. That's possible too. But even if those are not what's going on, we can at least say a few things about what's happening. The first is that the death of Christ is clearly implied by mention of resurrection. To to be resurrected necessitates that one has died. So the death of Christ is, is there. And even the hope of some kind of atonement is implied in the call to repent. Because why would you repent in light of impending judgment unless there were some possibility of being spared? And we can also say, just based on how Paul operated, that whatever he didn't say in this one particular address, he would have said later as he's discipling and evangelizing and helping people understand what it means to follow Jesus. So we don't have to view this as a full and complete presentation of everything that Paul would want to say. But that leaves the question, why emphasize this? Why emphasize the resurrection as proof or a pledge of God's judgment and God's judgment specifically through Jesus? I think one possibility is that for a a people like the Athenians, inclined as they are to dismiss and ignore the God of Abraham, the resurrection of Jesus is a historical event that confronts them with the fact that the God of Abraham is not ignorable. So long as talk about God remains a speculative philosophical endeavor, debates will run on endlessly. Theories about God's nature will proliferate. That's basically the situation in Athens. But when God acts, when God intervenes in history, that settles things, that changes things. That has to be dealt with. Even the mere claim that Jesus has been raised and we saw him, that demands a response from the most secular, sophisticated Athenian there. How do you explain that? And in fact, it is still true today, thousands of years later, that people continue to find the evidence for the resurrection compelling. Because it is a historical fact that a movement of Jesus worshipers arose within years of the death of Jesus among a monotheistic people in the same part of the world where Jesus was put to death. That is a fact demanding an explanation. And the more you look into that, the the harder it is to actually explain that naturalistically. Now, here's the reality that Paul would be the first to say. For a person to become a Christian, for a person to embrace The risen Christ with faith and repentance requires supernatural intervention by the Spirit. The Spirit has to make us new so that we can really see who Jesus is, believe in Him, embrace Him with faith. But if we can picture that act of new birth uh, as, as lighting a fire in our hearts, then I think it would be fair to say that among the kindling which the Spirit lights on fire, with his regenerating work. Among that kindling 
is evidence for the resurrection. We see in the book of Acts that the apostles get up and among the proclamations that they make is, we are witnesses. We have seen him. And so what we can do with our unbelieving friends, neighbors, coworkers, and family members is ask them to look at the evidence. Ask them to read a book like The Reason for God by Tim Keller. Ask them to read the Gospels with you. Because for a secular person, the resurrection seems easy to dismiss from a distance. But the closer you look at it, the harder it is to dismiss. Not impossible, but harder. So we can ask our secular friends and neighbors and family members to consider the evidence of the resurrection of Christ. So because the gospel is for everyone, it can be explained to anyone. And in the book of Acts, this is probably the the one encounter that the gospel has with people who are the farthest removed from the thought world of the gospel itself. They they had the most uh, need for explanation for it to make sense. And we have here one example of how Paul the apostle did that. And so we can be encouraged not just to apply these principles, but to be encouraged and heartened that the gospel can be explained to anyone. And so what that means for you and me is not that we're probably going to get an opportunity this week to stand up in some public square and give a speech like Paul's, but it means that we can do something. We can try one of these things, confident that the people we care about need it, and that God can use it. Because even in Athens, people believed. In this formidable, forbidding environment, with so many things stacked against faith in the gospel, people responded. It wasn't a lot, only a few, but they responded. And so as people of the gospel, as people who have come to believe that the message is for everyone, we can be confident that it can be explained to anyone. So let us be a people who are willing to do that, willing to try even when it would be easier to just say nothing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news that your Son has come taking on our nature, that he has died for our sins, that he has been raised for our vindication, and that he is at your right hand ruling, and he will return to judge the living and the dead. We rejoice, Lord, we we reset our hopes this morning to that message, and specifically we ask that you would help us to reset our hopes for our friends and neighbors, our coworkers and family members, who not only might not know you, but think of the world in terms that make the good news utterly bizarre, almost incomprehensible to them, deeply offensive. God, help us to have the courage and the wisdom to bear witness. And would you bless our efforts? Would you draw more people to your son? Would you give them eyes to see what is really there? His beauty, his glory, his sufficiency as a savior and king. Amen.